Hello, this is Carla Ray Thompson, and this is Unsolicited Opinion, Food for Thought, Fueled by Facts. Episode 2. This week's Food for Thought is going to take a bit of a somber turn. And one of the things, oh, the thing that I will be asking myself and you as well is, can you trust New York City with your dreams and or your life? I'm also going to talk about the late fashion designer, Katie Gallagher, whose recent death prompted me to ask these very questions. As you fashionistas know, the first Monday in May is fashion's most celebrated event, the Met Gala, and it's less than one month away. And this year's event is going to be honoring Karl Lagerfeld. But for every Karl Lagerfeld, whose legacy will be celebrated at this year's event, there is a Katie Gallagher who toils on the periphery in a measure of obscurity, whose greatest desire is to have their art, their self-expression, sustain their modest lifestyle, and to have professional independence. At the center of it all is New York City, a fashion mecca, where dreams are born, nurtured, or at least where they once were. I want to talk a little bit more about Katie Gallagher. Recently, I learned that the death of indie fashion designer Katie Gallagher was ruled a homicide by the New York City Police Department. What I also didn't know was that Katie had passed away in July of 2022, eight months prior to this revelation. Katie was found dead of an overdose in her Lower East Side Manhattan apartment, according to published reports, and the New York City Police Department determined that Katie, who died of the combined effects of drugs, which included fentanyl, may have been the victim of a sophisticated criminal ring who drugged and robbed their victims of their possessions. When I heard about Katie's death, I was floored. I mean, stunned, heartbroken, a whole rush of emotions overtook me and complicated emotions that prompted me to think about death, about New York City, about those who go to the city to pursue pursue their dreams. Is New York the place to do that anymore? Um, Is it safe? Are your dreams safe? Are you safe? I can't say that I knew Katie, like uh, she was a best friend, she, or, or even a casual acquaintance. What my interaction with Katie was through an interview I did with her when she first started back in 2009. The interview I did with Katie was for a pop culture blog I had at the time called The Ride Popping Off About Pop Culture. And the interview is still on the site and is referenced on Katie's Wikipedia page. Katie also has a special place in my heart because her spring summer fashion show um, presentation, it wasn't a runway show, in back in 2010 was my first New York Fashion Week experience. Katie, who was a graduate of the prestigious Rhode Island School of Design, the gal from rural Western Pennsylvania, who in her own words was born between a farm and a forest, moved to New York City in 2009 immediately after graduation. And the city gave her a chance to live her dream, but sadly also robbed her of her life and possibly of her legacy. Long after the interview, I continued to follow Katie on social media. I got to see her process. I got to follow her journey. And that journey led to 10 collections over the course of 11 years. I would call Katie's work avant-garde, for lack of a better term. Yet it was um, interestingly accessible. It had a minimalist quality. Most of the time it was monochromatic. She never, she said she never wanted her clothes to be age specific. She was as those who knew her and her work would agree ahead of her time. Katie was doing Lululemon like leggings before Lululemon became a household name and a yoga studio staple. In my interview with Katie back in 2009, she said that her clothing was representations of herself and the things she believed in. She said, and I quote, They are the image I'd like to see, and through that, the ideas about fashion I'd like to project. When I asked why she chose to set up shop in New York City, Katie said this, I chose to move to New York City after graduating because it's what I know right now. 
It's where I can source great fabrics and meet the people I need to meet. I don't believe one can easily design creatively and successfully with all the advantages of New York City anywhere else in the U.S. Back in 2009, Katie said the biggest challenge she faced launching that first collection, which was back in 2009, where she did everything from drawing to pressing the finished garment to, she said, licking the back of thousands of invites and all forms of PR was monetary. By the way, the monetary challenge remains even after her death. Her family set up a GoFundMe to raise money to mount Katie's final collection. So far, they've raised 32,000 of the 50,000 needed. For Katie to do what she did, to leave familiar surroundings and embark on an unfamiliar path, there had to be a dream, a vision, a heartfelt purpose. So I asked Katie in that interview, which happened more than a decade and a half ago, what's the dream? Her response was simple. She said, I want to be able to survive by designing my own collections. I don't want to be someone's employee. She was a soul who lived simply. She lived simply for her art. And she had success, success that was on her own terms. She was featured in publications like Vogue and Elle, and her designs were worn by the likes of Lady Gaga and Laverne Cox. I was so happy she had the opportunity to live her dream. Watching her, even from afar, was inspirational. But Katie's death has inspired me in an altogether different way. It has me thinking about art, artists, and New York City. Was Katie the last of a breed to go to the big city of big dreams, New York City, New York, New York, to create, to be inspired, and not just to flex on the gram and TikTok and do brunch? New York City was once that place, the place, for art and artists. You had badasses like Basquiat and benefactors like Brooke Astor. Just in case you're wondering why you should care about art, artists, and where that art can be nurtured and supported, artists lend a voice to the voiceless and are capable of seeing a world as it is and also as it could be. I often wonder, and at, at this time more so than ever, um, who's going to speak for us? Is it going to be the rich and well-connected who don't have to worry about rent? The posers, the Nepo babies? Are they going to be the people that populate the artistic community of the future? And where will New York City be in all of this? What role will the city play? They say hip hop is dead, R&B is on life support, and rock hasn't been rolling for quite some time now. Broadway is financially out of reach for the masses and is primarily made up of revivals and movie remakes. And about hip hop, this year marks the genre's 50th anniversary. With its roots in the poorest of New York City's boroughs, hip hop channeled anger into art and changed the world. And they did it with two turntables and a mic, a can of spray paint, and a piece of cardboard. Could hip hop have been born in today's New York City? Who will challenge us to get out of our comfort zones, to create the next cultural genre? Who will become the next boutique designer who will be fashion forward instead of retreaded retro? Who will be the next Katie Gallagher? And will New York City ever be the place that it once was, an incubator for the arts in all of its forms? A safe haven for self-expression or just plain safe? Rest in peace, dear Katie. This is Carla Rae Thompson, and this is Unsolicited Opinion, Food for Thought, Fueled by Facts. <laughs>